Thank you to Judge for being here. Thank you to my fellow debaters and thank you to my partner for being here. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The revolution was ignited by this battle cry for equality and, represent and representation, yet a decade later when the founders gathered in Philadelphia to erect a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, they fell short of their lofty ideals and a more cynical reality took hold. We resolved that the Electoral College must be abolished through a constitutional amendment to overturn the 12th Amendment and be replaced with a popular vote in order to perfect the American experiment that they started for the following reasons. First, the Electoral College was established when slavery was the law of the land. Racism is ingrained in the very DNA of the Electoral College and an edifice of America's original sin. On Thursday, July 19th, 1787, the speech, in the speech where he proposed the Electoral College with the Three-Fifth Compromise at the Constitutional Convention, James Madison, known as the father of the Constitution, said that the Negroes in the South presented a difficulty of serious nature. He continued that with a popular vote, the southern states could have no influence in the election on the scores of Negroes. If the founders were to have a direct popular vote, then the South's massive slave population could not be leveraged in the political influence. We are a very different country now. The Constitution is a living document intended to be amended, and it is our civic duty to do so. Today in practice, the Electoral College continues to carry a racial bias. Voters in rural, predominantly Caucasian states such as Wyoming and Nebraska, have around five times more influence than their urban counterparts with, in population centers with, with far more minority populations such as New York and California. Our second plank, the census is updated every 10 years and changes the number of electoral votes. This is not quick enough to account for changing, rapidly changing populations in states such as Arizona. Our third point, is along, the same, is along the same lines as our first, that different voters in different states have drastically different weight. One man does not equal one vote. California's 55 electoral college votes mean there are 705,000 people per vote, whereas there is only 195,000 for each of Wyoming's three electoral votes. This nation is founded upon the ideal that all men are created equal. As Dr. King in his famous I Have a Dream speech said, America, it's time to be true to what you said on paper. We are a beacon of democracy for the rest of the world, and it's imperative that we keep it that way. Our fourth plank is that, it is that the complicated electoral process dissuades people from voting. There is little more to say along this point except for the fact that many people, especially those with lower socioeconomic or economic backgrounds, don't understand the complicated electoral college process and are dissuaded from voting. Fifth. According to Rubin et al., the Electoral College and the rational vote, voting power is derived from the probability of breaking a tie. Mathematically, the probability of breaking a tie is significantly larger in a popular vote than the Electoral College. This is mathematically proven, and there are proofs to back it up. Sixth, the Electoral College discourages third party candidates, and a popular vote will empower third parties moving away from the current tyrannical two-party system and giving voters more options. Many voters this past election cycle were upset they didn't have more options. This is your answer. Lastly, one of the many reasons that the founders chose the Electoral College b beyond the racial, bi the racial basis was that the they did not trust the colonists to be informed about the candidates in faraway states now, in the 21st century, we are over-informed about our candidates. You have Facebook, Twitter, Saturday Night Live, CNN, Fox News. There's a 24-hour news cycle that carries through the election, and we know more about the candidates than we should, rather than less. So that justification for Electoral College should be thrown out. Lastly, I know, to close, I know that my counterparts are going to bring up the idea that the status quo is sufficient. There have only been five elections overthrown overthrowing the popular vote because of the Electoral College, and that we should be satisfied with the status quo, that there's not enough to justify something as radical as a constitutional amendment. But I'd like to bring your attention to a John Steinbeck quote, where he says, we now face the danger that has been the most destructive for the human race. 
success, plenty, comfort, and ever-pleasing leisure. No dynamic people has ever overcome these dangers. Don't fall victim to the status quo or complacency. Help us to create a more perfect union. Thank you. Um, I'm going to sit for the sake of the microphone. Okay. Um, on your seventh point, you addressed the lack of information that was assumed the average population would have as a reason for the founding of the Electoral College, correct? Yes. Um, okay, on that, doesn't that imply that electors would be voting differently than the population? It doesn't, but it was a safeguard. So there are obviously disloyal electors, but that's very uh, uncommon. That's why we didn't use it as a plank. Right, so doesn't the current existence of bound electors and the fact that electors almost always vote with the popular vote in their area, doesn't that um, work against this point, prove that we're no longer operating on the lack of information? I don't think... I'm saying that you can't use that as a basis for your argument. I'm not saying that. I'm confused as to what you're trying to say. Okay. Uh, we weren't intending to use it as a basis for okay. the argument, so I'm going to move on. Um, on the topic of a rapidly changing population, you note that the Electoral College is used by the census, right? But um, if we had a better way of determining the, the population, that wouldn't be mutually exclusive to the Electoral College, would it? If we had... So if we, we were we to... we don't have one, so that's... We if we were to establish one, that proposal would not be mutually exclusive to keeping the Electoral College. If, yes, if you had, if you were to overthrow the census, but that's, I think that's not relevant to this debate. Okay. Uh, you said that the complicated process dissuades voters. Yes. How do you establish that causal link? That's a good question. I think it's not, I, I don't think we have a source for this, but I think it's pretty obvious that there are plenty of people with lower ed educational or socioeconomic backgrounds that are dissuaded because of the process. So I don't disagree with you that some voters are dissuaded by the process, but how is that process the Electoral College, right? The process that normally people reference as dissuading voters is voter ID laws or um, other forms of unnecessary complicated ways of actually getting to the polls. I agree, but I'm tr I think our point is that destroy or abolishing the Electoral College is one step that we can take Voter IDs laws are generally left to the states, and that's not something we can address at the federal level as we are right now. Uh, I definitely understand what you're saying, but I do think that the a popular vote would encourage more people to vote because it's just so much simpler. People can understand that. A lot of people don't understand the Electoral College right now. Do you mind reiterating your point on the voting power of breaking ties? Voting power of breaking ties, absolutely. My partner is going to talk about this more. But according to Rubin et al., the Electoral College and the rational vote, voting power is derived from the probability of breaking a tie. Mathematically, the probability of breaking a tie is significantly larger in a popular vote than the Electoral College. There's a mathematical paper that he actually found for us that you're far more likely to break a tie through a popular vote than the Electoral College. And because of that, people feel like they have more influence and they'll be encouraged to vote and incentivized. Mm, okay, but isn't that untrue for a voter in, say, Ohio, right? Like the states that determine the election? But the, I would say the central plank of our argument is that all voters should be equal. Yes, there are certain people in Ohio and Florida, especially when you have the hanging chads in 2000, that severely influence the election of the ex executive. But our point is that everybody should have that kind of influence, not just a handful in certain states. Okay, you say that the Electoral College discourages third-party candidates. Yes. Um, isn't it possible that actually, for example, third-party candidates like Evan McMullen, who recently came very, very close to winning the electoral vote in Utah, but nationally came in at a very, very small percentage of the vote, actually only rose to national attention because of the Electoral College and under the popular vote would never have gained that amount of status? I completely disagree. I think that with a popular vote, he would have a real chance of getting elected. The whole idea, the whole reason that people even talk about third party candidates right now generally is because of it takes away from two party candidates and how that'll affect, uh, how a third candidate will affect the overall vote for a certain candidate. I definitely don't think so. Okay. All okay. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, 
All right, everyone's ready to go. Camera's rolling. We're good. All right, three, two, one, begin. Uh, I don't have a fancy preamble during my speech. I have a quote from James Madison saying that if the Electoral College be not perfect, at least it is excellent. What the negative side is going to be bringing to you in today's debate is the idea that the Electoral College is a tried and true system relied upon our nation for hundreds of years and changing it in one huge fashion would not actually bring any benefits. So first off, I'm going to be going over affirmative's case and then moving back on to some um, off points that we're going to bring in today's case. But to provide a brief overarching refutation, right? If you take a look at their well, what they're doing is a complete constitutional overhaul of the system, right? They're changing everything our, that our nation stands for. They're rewriting some of the original words in the first part of the Constitution that's supposed to be protected. And voters and the American public at large is not going to be happy about this, right? We're going to see that this new system is going to be under a microscope, that everyone's going to have something to say about it. At the end of the day, faith in the system and whether or not you think that the person elected is the right candidate is going to be much more scrutinized in their role, which is probably a bad thing because we want our individuals to have faith in our elector that they're able to lead. So let's actually refute their points line by line. First off, their idea that racism is integrated in the Electoral College. I'd rather look at the impacts in the status quo and talk about how it impacts racial minorities now, and I'll get to that in my off case, so I will address this later in my case. Secondly, when they talked about how the census is upheld and it's not quick enough, right? That may be true, but in our world, there's a place where you could pass a census reform where you issue the census more often or you encourage electoral votes more often, right? It's not exclusive to the fact that there's an electoral college that the census actually has something to do with it. And there is a room in our world that if this is a real problem, policymakers could really change it. So I think that has a lot of weight in today's round. Thirdly, they talk about the one man, one vote thing is upheld. I have two main responses to this. The first of which is the United States is a constitutional republic. We're not a direct democracy. We have a bicameral legislative system. The House in the Senate that directly refute the point that everyone should have one vote. We want to protect the minority. That's the reason we are a constitutional republic. We're going to get to that later. So it's not necessarily a tenet of the United States that there's one man, one vote. Secondly, we would rather we have our system actually uphold everyone's voting rights instead of just be able to say that each person has one vote. So we think that the actual end of the system being representative is more important than just one person giving every vote at the booth. Fourthly, they talked about how people are going to be dissuaded from voting. I have two main responses to this. First off, voter turnout isn't necessarily a means to an end, right? We think that getting voter turnout from actual processes is important, but just getting people to show up to the polls isn't necessarily a good thing. Furthermore, we believe that on the negative side of the House, there are ways to increase voter turnout within the basis of the Electoral College. We think those ways are more early voting, more voter registration, maybe more advertisements or more actual public education about voting. And we think that that would have more of an impact. So it's not a unique impact on their side of the House. When we talk about the mathematics of tie breaking, I'm willing to bite this point. What I can tell you is that in their world, it's going to be harder, way harder to recount elections. Let's talk about 2000. Now in Florida, there was one contested state and that took months. What if the entire United States is contested, right? If it's a 51-49 split, they might want to recount it. That could take six months. We don't know. And um, how they talked about how the popular vote will empower third parties. My two main responses to this are third parties are actually more represented on the negative side of the House because we see that people like McMullen can campaign to a small amount of people and actually receive enough support to maybe be a credible candidate. On the national scale, we see that it's very hard for someone to get 20% of the national vote. So third party candidates would give up to a large degree. Secondly, we see that when you actually take a look at the logical means of their argument, when it take when you take it to its end, which is that third party candidates are actually going to be represented, what are we going to have like a 40-40-20 split? If someone wins the presidential election with 40% of the vote with a plurality, that's not good for people's faith in them. And it means that someone's being elected president when they don't have an actual majority support, which is very bad for the democratic system writ large. So let's move on to the negations off case in today's case. Our first point is that there are better options to be able to achieve the popular vote on the negative side of the house that were within the framework of the Electoral College. And what do I mean by this? All that the Electoral College is, it is a constitutional system written in the Constitution that says states elect electors, electors go to D.C. and vote, right? But when you take a look at Maine and Nebraska, there are two states that actually do not have a winner-take-all system that my opponents are equating with the Electoral College. There are systems within the Electoral College where voters are able to actually, you can win 60% of Maine or 30% in Nebraska, right? And there's something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. It's something that 10 states have already signed on to, including California, that they've passed in their legislature, where states have decided that, say, you can pass something where if Hillary Clinton wins the national vote, all of the states in the compact then pledge their electors to the winner of that national 
national vote. That means that you can achieve a popular election within the framework of the Electoral College, and a lot of the impacts of their argument are non-unique. Why does this matter? It matters that these alternatives are better because, A, this is spending significantly less time, resources, money, and political capital to achieve it in this way. There's going to be less fighting, less factional warfare, and it's very, very difficult to pass a constitutional amendment. Secondly, we believe that this preserves the sanctity of the Constitution writ large. We believe that writing, rewriting the first few words of the Constitution probably isn't a good idea. It's probably a bad precedent to set, and we'd rather we do it through an actual democratic process. Se our second point today is that the Electoral College prevents tyranny of the majority. And what do I mean by this? What I mean is that a national popular election is like two wolves in a sheep deciding what's for dinner. The minorities at the end of the day are going to get completely overrun by majority opinions. And what happens in a national election is Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton can only preach to the choir in California and New York instead of trying to swing independent voters in swing states. What that means is that they become less moderate as a whole. And we believe that this hurts minority voters, that it hurts voters in rural areas when you're only cashing out in these states. And at the end of the day, there's a 2012, a joint study by the American Enterprise Institute that said that in the major 11 swing states, there's growing minority populations. That's what makes them the same. Jim Messina, an Obama campaign manager, quote is, we are better off expanding the electorate to minorities than we are focusing everything on the persuasion of white voters. The electoral system makes it a 50-50 split. And what that means is you have to appeal to the margins instead of just appealing to your own voter bloc. And it's for that reason that the Electoral College actually represents minorities a lot better than the popular vote system. Thank you. Um, see, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, I'll see standing. Yeah, yeah. First off, that was vetoed in California, so it's not in 10 states. I think it's, uh, there's already pushback against that. Uh, uh, for the split? For the compact. Yeah, it's the yeah, excess. Okay. Um, are you aware that a compact between the states would be illegal because you can't have interstate agreements without the consent of the federal government, so that Congress would have to vote on it anyway, so your means are aren't legal states can make compacts without the federal government being a part of it and not even for exact for not for electing the executive what i can tell you is that this is something that already exists the npvic is something that exists right now it's in the something exists, but it's something that's not into effect because it hasn't reached 270 once it gets over 270 70 votes and it affects the election of the, of the executive it's not legal anymore and it would have to be approved by Congress. You don't, well, you don't need 270 yeah, votes as a thing, right? Like if three major swing states sign onto it, it becomes a de facto when those swing states pledge, because they're swing states, it would be the popular vote then. So because it exists in the status quo and because it's a system that can be used to a large degree, it would be a de facto popular vote if only like Florida and Ohio signed up to it, right? Because if Florida and Ohio goes one way, the chances of that person winning is like 95, 100%. So it becomes a de facto popular vote even if they don't reach the the actual 270 margin. Yes, but for for to actually exec to elect the executive, it would have to be approved by Congress, because any interstate agreement like that has to be approved by Congress. Um, I honestly I don't know enough about the issue to okay. speak to that. What I know is that it exists in the status quo. It's been signed onto. Okay, and are you trying to say that you should change the census, or you could? That, that you true? could, that it's not unique on your side. Like the census impact, like, mm -hmm. right, if it's a big impact, legislators would have done something about it in our world, and they can continue to do something about it in our world. Okay, but that's not part of the resolution. No. Okay. And could you reiterate your race, uh, your rebuttal to our racism point really quick? Um, our first point. Yeah, sure. So my main thing is when I don't think it's very important to look at what was done in the past for the system. I think it's important to look at the impacts of the system now. And I think that now, because the system protects disenfranchised voters in areas like Florida, say, right, where the Cuban minority has a huge say in how the election works. And because it's a 50-50 state, you can't racialize an election, right? You can't say that we like white, white voters more, or you can't have like really, really anti-crime issues that hurt black voters, because that would tip a state like Florida or a state like Ohio one way or the other. So because you have to play on the margins and appeal to all groups, there's more representation for minority groups in the Electoral College. And in your world, you'll just have candidates like Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton appealing to voters in urban areas like Texas, urban areas like New York and California on the Democratic side. And it would be more of cashing in on extreme values and getting your own constituents to show up than trying to swing independent and minority voters who are undecided. But you wouldn't disagree that other states such as New York have more d disenfranchised voters or their voters have less influence in urban areas because of the Electoral College right now, compared um, to predominantly white states such as Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming. Yeah, I would agree with that. But what I would say is that 
the Electoral College overall reflects the will of the populace more. And I think that the minority votes and those mattering more and you being able to reflect the will of the populace is more important than you having a tier of the majority and everyone's vote being like de facto one by one equal. Because what happens in your world is when everything is like mathematically equal, right? It's not equal in the sense that a minority vote is the same as someone who's a majority. How so? It's a popular vote. They all count the same. Yeah, but say it's like 70% majority and 30% minority. If there's a candidate who just mollifies the majority candidates the entire time, they can pass extreme policy that completely undermines the will of the minority. And it would be a policy that was 100% majority. And we think that those minority interests are then disenfranchised to the degree where they shouldn't be in our political system. So we believe that the Electoral College is a way of protecting those minority rights and to achieve a system where a tier of the majority isn't existent anymore. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So first, I'm going to run through their arguments and then go back to ours and repeat theirs first. So. Uh, he said that uh, voters will not be happy with the with um, refuting the electoral college because they say it's going to show inconsistencies and people won't trust the system as much. However, that's not true. People are already calling out for its abolishment. There's a large number of people in this nation who are saying the electoral college is, followed, is flawed and don't want it to exist anymore. So we can clearly see there is popular support for this. It would not be a resisted um, movement. So you say there are better options like uh, with, to uh, use the electoral votes like in Maine and Nebraska or with the uh, uh, compact among states? Well, first off, the compact is not working. It was actually vetoed in California. It's not existing. There's already pushback and resistance that's making it almost irrelevant. Um, also, as we can see, their better system that they say is used in Maine and Nebraska is only exists in two states, yet all of them have that. There's clearly not a whole lot of support for this, and states aren't implementing it. So while there might be better um, systems out there that could incorporate the Electoral College, they are not supported. They're not being used. Um, you also say that it's hard to pass an amendment, which is true. However, in this case, it's worth it because it'll bring about a lot of benefit for all the people in this country. You say that we shouldn't amend the Constitution because it undermine, undermines people's trust in it. However, the whole purpose of amendments is so it can change. It's a living document. And as situations in the world change and as our social climate of this country changes, so too should the Constitution. It's not something, it's an over 200 year old document. It can't be kept in its original state. Times change and we need to change with them. Um, you claim that minorities will be overrun and that, uh, however, with like the major 11 swing states with more minorities and it gives them more power. However, on the, um, According to uh, the Electoral College, why it should be abolished, which is a research paper by John D. Farrick, he outlined it to points where essentially groups in one state can unite with groups in other states, and the votes of all will be counted at the national level. This factor could well increase the voting strength of groups whose members were distributed throughout the United States. So you claim that minorities in certain states can have more power through the Electoral College. However, minorities across the entire nation can unite and get behind a candidate, and all of their votes will count for that. Because even if a large number of minorities in, say, Georgia, choose to vote for one candidate, but the vote typically goes the other way, all of their votes, the person they're trying to support, are essentially worthless. They don't count for anything. They don't go towards that person at all. However, minorities in Atlanta can unite and communicate with more minorities all across the United States, especially with our current methods of communication and social media. It allows them to essentially unite and give them even more strength. Um, now, on our arguments, um, they said when it came to the uh, census not being fast enough, they said that they can pass census reform. However, the census, this issue has existed once again for a very long time and no one has done anything. They're saying there's all kinds of ways to solve these problems, but no one is even thinking about doing them. No one's even discussing doing them. This electoral college reform, not only is it will it help like some of the things they're saying can happen, people are supporting it, people are behind it. And it's a real, actual policy that can happen, and that is feasible. So they say that um, the votes are not weighted, or we claim that we said the votes are not weighted equally, and they say we're, we're a republic, and 
so it should not be like direct representation. However, that's how the con Congress works. But in, when they were initially writing the Constitution, there was even discussion on whether or not they should do a direct or electoral vote. And many of the uh, framers who were arguing for the direct vote claimed that the, pres the president is a direct connection to the people. That he is sort of, he's over, I mean, as the executive branch, his job is to enforce the Constitution. And by that reasoning, he should be directly elected by the people. Many of the framers were saying that. So the uh, current system also discourages voting. They said that voter turnout is a means to an end, and it would be harder to, or they say that uh, voter turnout is a means to an end. And they say there's all other, all kinds of other ways to increase voter turnout. Once again, these ways are not being implemented. However, the Electoral College would increase it, or would increase voter turnout. So the, our, according to uh, Richard uh, J. Sebula and Dennis R. Murphy in the Electoral College and Voter Participation Rates and Exploratory Note, uh, the Electoral College introduces into the presidential election process certain disincentives to vote. These disincentives essentially take the form of reducing the perceived benefits of voting for a presidential candidate by restricting the power of votes to state jurisdiction rather than allowing all votes of equal value in a national election determined strictly by popular vote. So once again, when people's individual votes count for more, which also by the uh, mathematical uh, formula we found, it's a, uh, essentially the probability that your vote like influences the election a certain amount is much higher in a direct election than through a, the electoral system. And so if people's individual votes count for more, then they're going to be more likely to go vote because they'll actually feel they have a voice and they're making a direct impact. Uh, they also say, they say that it'd be harder to recount if people call for recounts. I would argue that that's okay. Recounts, even if it's hard to recount, it's still worth it if it's giving people more of a voice and it's making sure that it's accurate and that it's the proper way to do it. Uh, they claim that this would not encourage, or that the current system encourages third party votes because someone almost won Utah. Once again, even though he almost won Utah, he got pretty much, he got no electoral votes towards his actual candidacy. However, this way people can actually obtain large numbers of votes. Um, and I think that's all my time, so. Um, six, seven. Um, all right. Would you agree that in swing states, voters have a perpetual incentive to show up and vote? Um, to an extent. So yes. a, a voter in Ohio would feel as if his vote always mattered, right? Yes, but a voter in, say, Georgia wouldn't. Okay. Uh, but if, say, this past national election, if Hillary had 66% of support, or if one election candidate was winning by a landslide, wouldn't that take the Georgia problem to a national level and no one would feel an incentive to vote? Oh, you mean like overall? Yeah, like if one candidate was winning the national polls by a landslide, why would anyone show up to vote in your world? Well, if they're winning by a landslide, then a lot of people have already showed up to vote. Otherwise, it's such a small number of people who have voted that it's too early to actually like statistically say that's relevant and people would still be able to vote. Well, what if they're winning in a landslide in the polls, right? What if 538 says Trump is going to win this election 100%? Well, people were saying that about Hillary. They were saying she had about a 70% chance to win going into the election and she barely won the popular vote. But your argument is that people in Georgia and California won't show up because they feel as if the election is predecided in their state, right? No, they, f well, yeah, in their state. So because if people feel that the election is predecided nationally, they wouldn't show up either, right? No, that's not, you no, know, because it, it, sort of correlates differently. So in Georgia, it's different because, you know, you have a certain number of, there aren't very many independent voters is the issue. And if there aren't very many independent voters in that state and it always goes one way, you feel your vote doesn't matter. However, when you're directly seeing that, all right, my vote is actually being counted towards my candidate, it's not just being swallowed up in a sea of people who are in a, of a different political background than me, then yeah, that makes it work a lot better. Right, and you would agree that in an individual election, each individual mo vote matters less to the total outcome than in a state or smaller local election, right? Um, yes. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on to the Constitution. Do you think it's a good precedent to be set to be able to rewrite the Constitution anytime you need something changed in the United States? Yes, but we've already done that. Like how, how, how many, we've got, I don't know how many tens of amendments we have. People are changing it all the time and they are good changes. It's, the whole purpose of the Constitution is that it can be changed as needed. Okay, but if there is a way to do it outside of amending the Constitution, wouldn't you agree that that's a better way to be doing it? If it can be done that way, but no one's actually pushing for it to be done that way. Okay. Um, okay. Thirdly and finally, um, let's talk about my let's yeah let's talk about minority voters to a certain degree. Um, 
you would agree that turnouts in California and New York City are lower in the status quo than turnout in Ohio, right? Like percentage rates. Yes. And okay, tell me what you think about this Donald Trump quote then. If the election were based on total popular vote, I would have campaigned in New York, Florida, and California and won even bigger and more easily. What do you think about that? That shows that he would have campaigned in more places more often, so that's actually a good thing. Well, doesn't that show that he would only be campaigning in three states and not be campaigning in rural areas or minority voters outside of huge urban population centers in California and New York? No, because I think that quote is saying he would have done that in addition to. He's not saying I would have only campaigned there. He's saying I, he's saying he would have approached it differently. So he would have devoted more time. He would have, essentially he would have actually spread his time out more. He wouldn't have just focused on where he did. He would have gone to more places. Okay, but you would agree that campaigners would have an incentive to try to cash in on votes in California instead of trying to swing votes in Ohio because there are more total aggregate number of votes to be had in California, right? Yes. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Um, I would first like to continue by rebuilding a portion of our own case and addressing their rebuttals and then move on to addressing their points uh, sequentially. Um, on the point that there are more effective means that we offered, there is a more effective means of changing to a system more similar to popular vote or that, according to the other side of the house, more equitably represents the population. Um, they said that there is no, that because there is popular support for changing the electoral college to a straight voter system, uh, there wouldn't be opposition. That's not a direct causal link. Just because there is support for something doesn't mean there isn't opposition for it. In fact, usually support and opposition happen concurrently. Our concern is that at any moment, at the moment you decided to change it, the next election or the next few elections would be under much stricter scrutiny by the public and by the media because the question would be, well, you wouldn't have won under the electoral college system and you did win under the popular vote in this case. Why was the change made now, right? So those elections would be under um, more scrutiny than before. Additionally, they tried to argue that there are not more effective means for changing the system from the electoral college um, with the winner takes all system because none of them are being implemented. Uh, we don't find this argument to be rational. The fact that a means isn't being implemented doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it's not better. In fact, if that were to be the case, that would invalidate their entire point about the popular vote. The popular vote isn't currently happening and thereby we could say it's not a better system. Um, on the NPVIC, the, the compact between the states, um, actually, um, according to their point, you would need a congressional approval, and we do not dispute that. But you would need a straight majority in Congress as opposed to the two-thirds majority is necessary for passing a constitutional amendment. Um, and lastly, on their point that the Constitution is a living document, uh, we do not dispute this, but to say that a dozen amendments over the course of nearly 250 years um, is proof that amendments happen, quote, all the time is completely um, a fallacy. Uh, the primary way in which we change the Constitution is by changing our interpretation uh, through Supreme Court decisions, through legislative decisions, and a number of other decisions. And to work within the Electoral College system uh, to adopt this compact or do what Nebraska and Maine do would be exactly this. We would be allowing it to be a living document by changing our interpretation and yet not changing the text and thereby delegitimizing it. Um, we would also like to further um, build our point that this prevents tyranny of the majority, the Electoral College does, in that it helps to represent historically underrepresented and disenfranchised groups in the United States. First, it helps to represent minority groups um, in that, as my partner mentioned, the Electoral College makes it impossible for candidates to ignore a racial minority, not because that racial minority always determines the election, but because they never know if that racial minority might be the one to determine the election, right? So for example, in 2000, uh, Bush and Gore were not necessarily expecting that the Cuban vote in Miami date would swing Florida, would swing the entire nation, but that's exactly what happened. So a candidate who's always in that position can never make particularly racialized or racist comments that um, ignore the needs of minority voters on the off chance um, that that minority happens to be the one that swings the election, right? So it occasionally allows certain minorities disproportionate amounts of power in the electoral process, which prevents tyranny of the majority and serves as a safeguard. Um, additionally, when candidates are forced to campaign to minority candidates um, in certain areas to win states, uh, so depending on which states have a higher representation of minorities, and those happen actually to be swing states. Swing states have a higher representation of minorities than other states. Uh, so yeah, we don't disagree with their assertion that there are more minorities in California than there are in Nebraska, but those are terrible examples of a non-swing state and a swing state. Um, it reduces the problem to more than it actually is, right? Um, 
So as my partner mentioned, a joint study by the American Enterprise Institute and the Center for American Progress found that the 11 swing states have growing minority populations, and actually, as a whole, the swing states tend to have more minorities than the non-swing states. Uh, we also want to talk about disenfranchised voters like rural voters, which is uh, a point that the other side has not tried to contest. Uh, we're concerned that rural voters under the current under the popular vote system would go completely neglected uh, because it's very difficult to campaign over a spread out territorial area um, when you can just focus your time in population centers like Donald Trump implied he would. Um, and for this reason, we think that the interests of minority voters, which are actually one of the few interest groups that has widely divergent interests from the rest of the nation, um, would go underrepresented in tyranny of, of the majority would actually be, be detrimental to the entire nation in that way. Uh, to address their points sequentially, um, our largest problem with their case is that they try and hold us responsible for every defect of the status quo. We're not defending the status quo across the board, we're defending the electoral college system, right? We're not saying that other changes can't be made to our political process, and to assume that we are um, holds us responsible for something we never agreed to and isn't in the resolution. We already rebutted their point about minorities in our constructive. Um, that the rapidly changing population is irrelevant. We're not the ones who decided upon what the census is. Um, we're OK with changing the census. We don't really think the census is of much relevance here. Um, on their point as to the different weights of votes, um, they said as evidence that um, the Constitutional Convention briefly debated doing a direct vote but they didn't, so we're not really sure where that contention leads them. Um, just because something was discussed by the Founding Fathers doesn't mean it was their intent, especially when it wasn't the thing that they put into text. Um, on the point as to why the complicated process dissuades voters, we don't think that they've established a causal link between the Electoral College and a loss of voter turnout, particularly not because of the complications of the Electoral College. Um, I think most people either understand the Electoral College or don't care to because they know their vote still matters for something. The complicated process they're probably referring to is voter ID laws and a number of other things we don't have control over. Um, their point on the voting power breaking ties, I don't think most Americans sit around and calculate the mathematical odds. I like math and it still took me two go-arounds to understand exactly what it was they were saying. Um, I don't think the average American really thinks about it that way. And furthermore, it's location-based. It's different in Ohio. And on discouraging third-party voters, they haven't given us impacts. Our only question is, so what? Thank you. You go first. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to oh, stand. Yeah. Cross eyes. Sorry, step back. All right. Um, so, uh, first off, you say that the rural voters have more influence now and that like no one will campaign there, but how many campaign trails actually go to places like Albany, Georgia, or somewhere out in the rural states? Who actually goes out there and campaigns? So actually, pretty much all of the candidates spend a decent amount of time stumping in Ohio, Iowa, and a number of other predominantly But they stop in the population places. centers of those areas. They don't actually go out to the rural locations and go out to find some small town somewhere and talk to them. They don't do right. that. Right, but we're looking at two avenues of my proxy, right? So the first one is that someone in Des Moines, Iowa, cares how Iowa as a state is doing in general. So even if they live in a population center in that state, they are far more affected by the farmer that lives an hour away from them than someone who lives in Manhattan is affected by that particular farmer. Uh, so in that way, the candidates still have to appeal to rural interests. And we're looking at a second by proxy point, which is that if they are campaigning to small towns in Iowa and Ohio, they are by proxy also speaking to the issues of farmers in Georgia or non-contested states. But what I'm saying is that they aren't even campaigning. They, they don't go, like your, your argument was that they don't campaign where, like, or in these rural areas, but they aren't, they already aren't doing, or like they will not if we abolish the electoral college, but they are already not doing that. Right, so we're not asserting that the way. Electoral College is the end-all, be-all, and that it cures the problem of politicians not spending time in, like, sparsely populated areas in Montana that have one farmer and four coyotes. We're just saying that there are circumstances under which um, the Electoral College makes it more likely that they spend more time in those areas, right? So we would rather that politicians spend more time uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, and in Columbus, Ohio, rather than Manhattan and L.A. and Miami, and we think that that better uh, better represents the interests of rural voters who live in closer proximity to the people who are hearing these campaign speeches, right? Like, you're a farmer and you live in Iowa, you can drive an hour to a campaign rally. You can't exactly You actually really set. can't. They don't have time to do that. Farmers are... They okay, well, that's they, not they, not really a, a point of contention here. I'm, I'm sure some farmers can and do, and I'm sure some can't and don't, but uh, that's largely besides the point, right? So what I'm saying is that someone in a rural area or from one of those states actually finds it more more important that politicians are in their state or in their proximity than like halfway across the nation in a population center. She said they can't be like, because of the electoral college, candidates now don't make a 
Well, yeah, you are. Your whole. I don't know. I'll, I'll get that on my other, other thing. That's not really too close. Um. Uh, I think that's all I got. Hey. So what's what's so the deal? We have two minutes of two minutes of rest. Okay. For nice right. fast starting. Do you want to do it or do you want me to? Uh, either way. No. Okay. I, I mean, time first, yeah. I'm just gonna say, say but it's is it big talking about things that's gonna happen? Yeah, you can look at you can get the, the mic, but yeah. Okay. Are you sure you want me to do it? Okay. Right? Right. 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 So the big thing we need to hammer on is that they basically um, offer like fifty yeah, different camera lights, and they just keep saying like, oh, you could do this and you could do that. That's great, but you're not actually the person who would actually say, like, here's what we like should what do, yeah. like, or here's how it's being solved with things that are already This is the custom I might have never heard of. Yeah, say that. They're just being like, oh, this could happen, this could happen. That's great, but they're actually providing a plan. This is what's going to happen, this is what should happen, here's how it's going to help. They're just saying, oh, this could kind of fix part of that issue. This thing could happen, but none of that's going to happen. You just hammer on all the points. Like, Like so what well, like connect everything be like so like for this mathematical piece like the fact that like they're the can I bring this up too yeah you can bring all this stuff up because like the fact that this counts more is like that's why I'm only bringing it up mm -hmm. so you can use the constitution say, yeah so she asked like, she asked like so what like why does the, the whole third party thing matter mm -hmm. and you say describe this from or you already you already he actually he already said it was a tyrannical system. Mm -hmm. So just emphasize that because they just kind of <coughs> give it up, I guess. Um, once again, alright, so she said that if people supported That's people right. also against it. But maybe you say like people are people who support it. Like yes there are people on each side but people who support it. <laughs> so. All right, so what I believe this argument boils down to is that we have a concrete plan that we want to amend the Constitution, we want a popular vote, and we have concrete ways to do it. The opposition offers a lot of shoulds. We should change the census. We should do this, we should do that. Maybe we could do what Maine does. I'm from Maine. It took a lot to split the Electoral College in one state. For that to happen beyond just Maine and Nebraska is gonna take a lot of political capital a lot of time, it's gonna take just as much as it would to, if not more, because you have to go through every state, whereas you only need two thirds for a constitutional amendment. So it take even more time, capital, a lot of these restraints that they give us on our amendment. You're gonna have those same exact restraints to go through every single state and to uh, split the electoral votes. And we believe that amending the constitution is the best way to do this because it makes permanent the equality of the vote and stands true to the ideals that our founders uh, originally uh, strove for. In the same way that the const a constitutional amendment was used to solidify the woman's vote, the black vote, plenty, of mo plenty more other liberties were officially enshrined forever in the Constitution. It's a permanent way to say that we stand for this equality as a country. Just to reiterate really quick through our argument what we think are the voters, the largest one I would say would be uh, the racial bias of the Electoral College currently, and its, uh, cur its uh, status as a vestige of slavery. Uh, we also make, I would say secondly, would be the strong point that because of the popular vote, you will incentivize more people to come out and we prove this, even though you think that mathematically that doesn't, that a lot of people don't care about that, there are people that care about that, and we really think that if people were made aware that their vote would matter more because of the popular vote, that would gain a lot of political support. And they make a lot of points, 
such as I'll just run through that really our central idea is that you need equality, you need one person, one vote, and we need to stop suppressing the minority votes in urban population centers. And a lot of the reasons that the founders originally created the Electoral College are no longer relevant, such as slavery and an uneducated uh, populace. And it is our civic duty to amend the Constitution and to create a more perfect union and to uh, carry on this living document that is the Constitution. There's 27 amendments for a reason, and that's why it's a living document. Thank you. Three, two, one, and go. Um, so first off, I guess it's a little bit late, but I want to issue the first thank you of the round. Thank you to the University of Miami for having us. Thanks you for judging. Thank you guys for showing up. Um, thank you for whoever decided to use their time watching debates on the internet. I can't say I understand you, but good job. Um, all right, let's move into it. To start my voter issue speech off, I'm going to provide a little bit of a round conceptualization and then move on to two voter issues, the first of which being the representation of democracy in both worlds. I think there's been a lot of clash on whether or not minority groups are represented, whether or not voters are represented, and how the American will writ large is being expressed in either system, and I think I'm going to address that. And then I'm moving on to the other options that we're presenting on the table and the opportunity cost of those options. And thirdly and finally, I'm moving on the sanctity of the Constitution. Uh, that's an irrefutable impact that they haven't really tackled. So what we see as my opponent's main appeal to authority in today's debate is this idea that the founders have done things, therefore the founders are good. We see that the founders made the Electoral College in a racist manner in their eyes, and therefore that disqualifies the Electoral College. But then we also see that the Electoral, that the founders debated the idea of a popular vote, and therefore since the popular vote has the founders appeal to some degree that it's some a holy entity in their world there's a lot of there's a lot of questions about whether or not the founders even matter in this round. I personally don't believe that an appeal to authority of hundreds of years ago is really what decides the debate, but because it's contradictory in these two ways for a popular vote in electoral college, you can't really buy it anyway. I address this not because I believe it's important, but because they spent a large amount of their case on it, and if you decide to buy that, I want to have a refutation to it. So let's move on to my voter issues, the first of which being the representation of democracy in both worlds. This is the biggest one. This is the biggest point in debate. This is what we spent the most of the time talking about. So what affirmation is brought to you in today's debate is that every 
every vote should be mathematically equal, right? That's what they believe is the process in which we decide votes. And they believe that this is the best way to represent the will of the United States public at large. What we give you on the negative side is that we believe the best way to represent the will of the United States public and to elect officials that overall represent the national consensus of what ideas is, is not this mathematical idea. Those are the warring factions here. So the main problem with their idea is the idea of the tyranny of the majority, right? That if it's a 70-30 thing, as the analogy that I used earlier, it's two wolves and one sheep deciding what's for dinner. A lot of times what can occur is candidates can choose to mollify the majority group and completely forget about the minority group. And we see more extreme policy coming out of this and policy that completely forgets about, if not most of the minority groups in the United States, certainly a lot of minority groups that wouldn't have been forgotten about in the Electoral College. Furthermore, we see that my opponents have this fascination with the popular vote. Um, I think that there's a few things to respond to this, the first of which being this idea of the economist calculation, where people in their world understand that their vote just counts for less period, right? They say that people in the United States, California, New York, and Georgia are not showing up because they think that there's an insurmountable amount of votes to be climbed to make their vote matter. So therefore, they think that their vote doesn't matter and they don't show up to the polls, right? In a national election, that problem is expounded. We see that there's millions of votes that they have to climb the ladder for their vote to be able to matter. So they wouldn't show up at all because they know that their vote will have zero standing. So if anything, this popular vote opinion runs in the side of the negative. What the negative has brought to you in today's debate is that it's more overall representative of all groups in the United States as a whole. And what we mean by this is that candidates have to have trans-regional and trans-demographical appeal to be able to win the presidency in an electoral college. We've shown you links and we've shown you impacts to prove why this is true. We've told you that Obama's campaign manager himself said that the electoral college forces you to campaign to minority interests instead of placating white voters in urban areas. We've told you that what makes the 11 swing states distinct is that all of them have a growing minority population and you need some high percentage of the minority vote to be able to win that state. These are states where if you want to win the presidency, you cannot ignore minority votes. And oftentimes it goes further than that. You have to win the minority votes in order to win the election. We think minority votes are more important because they've been historically disenfranchised in the system that less minorities vote. Only 44% of Latinos uh, are registered to vote in the United States right now, while 78% of white people are registered to vote. And we believe that because these people are socioeconomically and politically worse off, that they should have more of a say in our system. Them, we believe that their system mathematically dis discriminates against these people because of the tyranny majority, but we believe that their world socially also discriminates against these people and that they have more of a say in that because of that. We believe that this outweighs anything brought at the affirmative side of the House pretty largely. There's more representation, better policies being passed, better candidates being elected, everything's better on our side of the House. And what they have is that people have this trance that things are mathematically equal and therefore they're more likely to show up. This is a much bigger impact. It affects policy, it affects everything. And writ large, we believe that minorities in the United States feel like they matter more in our world. Cubans feel like they matter more in Florida in our world. Voters in the South, black voters in North Carolina feel like they matter because they know that their vote can swing an election and their group that has to be campaigned to. Well, in their world, none of none such impact exists. Our second point is this idea that other options exist in our world. Let's talk about what's easier, right? In our world, we have this idea that a national compact can be signed. What happens is not 270 states have to sign onto it. Maybe electoral vote, 80 electoral votes have to sign onto it. But even if 270 electoral votes have to sign onto it, that's maybe half the states, probably a little less than that if you get big states to sign on, right? You also need one half of a vote in the House. That's nothing compared to passing a constitutional amendment. Passing a constitutional amendment is harder because the risk of failure is higher, and there's also a taboo-ness to actually passing a constitutional amendment. People don't do it very often because they realize it's a huge thing. So it's easier in our world, it's national news in our world, and it's things that states are actually doing in the status quo. This has more traction, this would be easier. So you see that if you believe any of their impacts, the negative side of the house has a better way to access them than what they're talking about. They're sailing around the Cape of South Africa to try to get to San Francisco from New York, and we're just driving straight there. It's a lot faster, it's a lot easier. Thirdly and finally, we have this idea of the sanctity of the Constitution. I just, it's a pretty simple point. I don't think it's a good idea to rewrite the Constitution. There are ways to not do it. They've admitted that there are federal and state ways to do this without writing the Constitution. And just rewriting the Constitution is bad. It sets a horrible precedent. I think most of these impacts are pretty clear for everyone watching this round. Um, it's for this reason that I'm proud to negate the resolution today. Thank you. Do you want us to? No. Wait. Yeah, sure.
Okay. I didn't know if we could. Yeah, I didn't know if you could. If we had to like stay positive. That was a great job, guys. That was a fun debate. Nice job.